And here they have this uh, breakfast cereal. It's called cuadritos. Huh? It's crisp. Crisp and clean. <laughs> Cuadrito kirtan. Mm -hmm. So welcome everybody to our, dar our darsha. <laughs> oh, I'm in one of those moods again. <laughs> what am I going to talk about? <laughs> Well, let's see. Uh, luckily, I've prepared something, so I don't have to think. Otherwise, I'd just sit here and grin at you. Okay. Nectar of devotion. Uh, sorry, nectar of instruction. I'm really, why should I? can't even read straight. <laughs> this is a very important little book. It's only a few shlokas long. But it uh, has the whole spread, the whole range of devotional service in it. Let's see, how long is it actually? 11 shlokas. And it really packs the whole process of devotional service into a very, very uh, compact range. So I'm going to read text 4. Dadati pratigrihnati. Guhyam akyati prichati bhongte bhojayate chaiva shadvibham pritilakshanam. Translation Offering gifts in charity, accepting charitable gifts, revealing one's mind in confidence, inquiring confidentially. Accepting prasad and offering prasad are the six symptoms of love shared by one devotee and another. Uh, so these are symptoms of devotional love. Sometimes people ask, well, you know, you're supposed to love Krishna and all that, but what about loving the devotees? How do we love the devotees? Well, this is how. Uh, the devotees are always exchanging gifts. Sometimes we give the gift of knowledge. Sometimes we give the gift of shelter. Sometimes we give the gift of correction. Sometimes we give uh, a boot out the door, <laughs> you know, to um, the appropriate persons. Right? And these are gifts. These are mercy. These are, these are different forms of exchanges, loving exchanges, actually. Uh, sometimes people give um, food and fruits and flowers. Sometimes people give Lakshmi, money. Sometimes they give their time. They give their attention. I mean, certainly, uh, one of the greatest gifts that anyone can give is their attention. Just giving their attention to a teaching is a very wonderful gift. Uh, Krishna appreciates this. And the devotees appreciate, too. When we feel that people are paying attention to our talks and discussions, then we feel like, oh, this is all worthwhile. If people weren't paying attention, it would be like, ah, why should we do this? Huh? But because they're paying nice, nice attention, um, then we feel more like sharing, more like giving from our treasury of spiritual wisdom. The next two are revealing one's mind in confidence and inquiring confidentially. Uh, inquiring and revealing, two sides of the same process. So for this to work, there has to be trust. Now, there has to be trust between the spiritual masters and the disciple. That means the disciple should be bona fide and the spiritual master should also be bona fide. If there's, and, and this is the reason why sometimes we have to kick people out the door, why we sometimes have to reject people. Uh, if they're not trustworthy, they can pollute the whole Sangha. If they're bringing some... Uh, other agenda, other than Krishna's devotional service, see, they can make everyone feel very uncomfortable, very insecure. 
if, there's, if they're going to introduce politics, you know, favoritism, or uh, some, you know, other process than pure devotional service into the Sangha, then uh, we have to reject them. You know, we try to correct them, but if it doesn't work, then we have to reject. We give them our association a little bit. If somebody is really, they seem sincere, you know, but just fallen. And uh, then there's some trial period, some probationary period. And if they can't uh, get it together to the, the proper standard, after some time, we say, no, sorry, you can't stay with us. We have to be very strict like that. Why? Because we have to uh, maintain an atmosphere of trust. An atmosphere where people feel that their confidential talks and revelations will not be misused. See? They're looking at me blankly because they, they have never experienced that in our association. Confirmed. Thank you. I've been very careful to protect them from that. Uh, but in other associations of devotees, you should know that it's like anything you say can be held against you. Can and will be used against you. Mm -hmm. So it's not exactly conducive to an atmosphere of trust. Huh? I mean, especially in the place where you live, the place, the ashram that you call your home, you should feel relaxed. You should feel like, oh, I can speak my mind. I don't have to censor what I say. I can just say whatever's on my mind. I don't have to worry about it because people are going to understand where I'm coming from. And uh, there's a... I have an expectation of trust. I have a reasonable expectation that what I say will, will not be used against me in a, in a way that will make me uncomfortable. But in, in, some, in other sanghas, it's not like that. In other sanghas, anything you say can and will come back to haunt you because somebody will use it against you at some future point. So what happens is the devotees do not inquire confidentially and they do not reveal their mind either. Remember what's his name? Mohan? Huh? Yes. Yeah. He was speaking. Remember we all felt immediately when he began to interact with us that he was speaking according to a formula. He wasn't speaking from his heart. He wasn't just being natural. He wasn't being uh, sincere. Because he had been in a Vaishnava association where it was politicized. Everything you said could be, you could be and would be used politically at some point against you by your political enemies. So the result of that kind of association is that nobody says anything from their heart. Uh, they construct a complete false personality uh, that resembles a devotee externally, but internally is full of fear. And they don't say anything that they really mean. They only say what they think they should, politically. See, this, this is the danger of, of politics, the danger of diplomacies, uh, the danger of um, a p replacing the devotional process with a political process. You see, is that you lose this dimension of sincerity. You lose this process given in nectar of instruction of inquiring confidentially and revealing your mind in confidence. Confidence. This is the word, confidence. I'm confident that I can reveal my mind. It's not going to hurt me. I feel confident. I can talk to you. I can say what's really on my mind. See, like we had one person here who was playing politics. Huh? And he was saying things to the devotees and not saying them to me. And of course, he would pick the weakest devotee and, and give his nonsense. And then 
thing, one thing led to another, and we had to kick him out. Well, actually, we didn't kick him out. We tried to correct him, and he left all by himself. We didn't have to even have to kick him out. We just tried to correct him. He couldn't take it. His false ego was too strong. Huh? So we find that if we keep our association free from these elements of politics and diplomacy, and uh, we don't politicize our relationships, we uh, keep our relationships pure and spiritual, devotional, then nobody develops the, uh, the communication problems where they feel like they can't speak what's on their mind, where they feel they can't open up and share and ask if they need some help or if they, if they uh, misunderstand something or if they have a personal problem, you know.